Okay, uh, so hopefully, as you've all seen, we're actually going to begin today with uh, another Socrative quiz. But I'm look behind the curtain here. Um, so uh, you should have all been sent a link earlier on today as well. Yeah. And also, you all like to head over to Socrative. Uh, so this quiz is uh, it's not a test, um, but it is a way to, to test your understanding of what we've, we've done so far. Um, hopefully you do quite well in this first question. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be running through this first, and this is just a way to see you know where everyone's at, and hopefully to, to bring up some some new interesting questions. Some of them. Uh, probably been answered after you asked questions about it anyway last week. Uh, looks like everyone who's here so far has, has answered that one, so we'll see how we did. You should be able to see this on my screen for reasons that will come clear. Ooh, <laughs> okay. Well, okay, I'll, I'll allow it. Um, so yes, uh, it is a way of doing distributed memory parallel programming, that's also correct. Um, it stands for the message passing interface. So both of those answers are in fact correct. Uh, so well done everyone, let's see what the explanation has to say. Ah, okay, yes. And this is the, to point out that some questions have more than one answer, uh, and when they do, you can select multiple. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next question, which might be a little bit tougher. Okay, so the compile and run an NPI program requires what? In these four options. So the compile an NPI program requires Special libraries. So the the special compilers, and I'll show the explanation here as well. So MPI is just a library. It's a library for doing message passing programming, um, but it is only a library. What's tricky about it <laughs> is that you get wrappers to compilers provided by MPI that allow you to compile MPI uh, programs more easily. But all those wrappers actually do is they provide all the linking instructions to the MPI library for you, so you don't have to, to put those in yourself. So MPI CC is actually just, say, the GNU compiler, or on Cirrus, you're most using the Intel compiler. Um, it is not a special MPI compiler, it is just your standard system compiler, but with additional arguments that link to the MPI libraries provided for you. Um, MPI itself is a standard that defines the interface to a library, so MPI implementations are those libraries. Okay. Okay, and uh, as these others, you'll realize you need a special computer or a special operating system, you can run MPI on any computer. So let's move on. After initiating an MPI program with MPI run dash n4, what does the call to MPI init do? Slightly tougher one this time. Okay, so this one, is tougher. So the correct answer is enable the four independent programs so that subsequently to communicate with each other. MPI init sets up the resources that MPI requires um, to allow communication and all other MPI calls to be made, um, but it doesn't do anything more than that. So uh, creating the four parallel processes, that's actually the job of the MPI launcher. Okay, I'll show this explanation here, which hopefully agrees with me. So the MPI launcher creates the parallel processes. Those processes are running from the very start of your code. So from the beginning of the main, if it's C uh, or C++. Um, and they are in exactly the same way that any executable would run, except there's four copies of it. Okay, what the MPI init does is it allows MPI calls to begin being made. And equally, MPI finalize, um, frees all the resources required by the MPI library. Um, um, but after that point, you can no longer make any MPI calls. But the program is running from the start of main, which may well be before, well, certainly will be before uh, MPI init. It may even be some way before. There's nothing to stop you putting stuff above the MPI init as long as there's not an MPI call. Um, Stunning program execution, that, as I said, is, is, is from the start of main. Um, so you can happily run four completely independent processes, four independent copies of the program. Um, without any actual MPI included, simply using the MPI launcher. What the MPI in it does is it allows communication. But uh, good that everyone avoided the, the threads uh, option. 
So MPI deals with processes, uh, lower level things deal with threads. So if you call MPI receive and there is no incoming message, what happens? How well done uh, all those who did answer. Yes, the receive waits until a message arrives, potentially waiting forever. Um, so however, no, 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 however. This is a, so this won't happen, okay, unfortunately. That would actually be nicer um, if it would eventually fail with an error. But the fact is there's no timeouts in MPI. Um, you can implement your own timeout system. I've had to do it before on a project. Uh, it was an absolute nightmare. It doesn't really, it's, there's so much about it that you need to configure separately. Um, for different machines, it's very difficult to, to make useful. Um, and that's one of the reasons that MPI just doesn't bother. So MPI makes the assumption that you have written correct code. Um, whether or not it's a safe assumption <laughs> is, is neither here nor there. It makes it. Um, and if you don't, it will just keep on waiting. It will deadlock. Um, what that does mean is that it allows optimizations to be done uh, by the library implementers. Part of the rationale for doing it that way is that you can write code to optimize these things on the basis that it will always be correct rather than having to worry always about whether or not a message is actually going to arrive. Because if you always have, if you have to do timeouts, you have to constantly pull, you know, and check and keep looking and then eventually say, okay, and then throw an abort. And it consumes a lot of resources that fundamentally aren't needed. Uh, so well done. Okay, if you call NPI synchronous send, and there is no receive posted then. See how we did? Okay, so again, it actually won't fail with an error, it will just deadlock. Um, and just wait, it'll assume that there is a receive and it will wait forever. Um, so with the S send, this is also not true. The messages are not stored. Um, uh, it will just sit in, in that buffer. Um, in the SN, and the SN will never return, allowing that buffer to be reused. Uh, it will just do this. The next version here points out it's like making a phone call, um, or a one that wouldn't eventually kick you off either. Phone calls actually do time out eventually. Uh, MPI will not, or MPI sends will not. It will just wait. And it's not always easy to know that that's happened. So uh, on something like Archer or Cirrus, if you've gone through the, the PBS queue, then eventually it will just kill it. You'll run out of time. Ah, okay. Um, so Ablex is asking about a uh, MATLAB lab probe from the parallel computing toolbox. Um, saying it's asynchronous. Uh, so, yeah. Um, also, the, be careful about the distinction between synchronous and, uh, and blocking. Um, there are different things. There's blocking and non-blocking. There's also synchronous and asynchronous, and we'll be covering uh, a lot more in the next lecture uh, later this afternoon. In fact, so we're going to be talking about non-blocking um, communications next. So hopefully this will be a lot more clear. So from last week, uh, the things that are synchronous and asynchronous are S sends are synchronous, B sends are asynchronous because they free the buffer immediately. Um, and MPI send could be either. So the, the synchronous versus asynchronous is whether or not the, the buffer which you've used to send or receive into is readily available again, or no, just the buffer that you're sending from is readily available again. There's only a synchronous receive, and um, so just receive. And um, yeah, it's about that they're blocking functions. Sorry, yes, they're blocking functions. So. Uh, as soon as they complete, the buffer is reusable because they are blocking. Um, but some are synchronous and some are asynchronous. And then this week, we will look at non-blocking functions. And again, some are synchronous, some are asynchronous. Um, so more on that later. OK. Uh, let's go on to the next question in this quiz. So if you call <laughs> it's related. If you call MPI asynchronous send, uh, buffered send, send, and there is no receive posted, which of the following are possible outcomes? 
to hold for the answer to this all. Nick would have just said a little bit clearer as well. Let's see how we did. Okay, so possible options with the buffered send. Um, so the message won't disappear. The send may fail with an error. Um, it won't wait until the receiver is posted, so it's not synchronous. Uh, there's an asynchronous communication, um, so it won't deadlock, which is nice. Um, the message is stored and delivered later on. Yep, that's its, it's main aim. So everything goes well, that's what will happen. Um, and the sending process continues execution regardless whether the message received also correct because it's asynchronous. Uh, as ever, it will not time out. Um, so the reason, however, that we discourage the use of B sends is this: the send fails with an error. That's possible if your buffer space is full. Um, and whether or not that will happen, uh, if you are relying on a system buffer, it's obviously machine dependent. If you are attaching your own buffer, which is a better idea, um, and indeed. In many cases, well, if you're using B send at all, you actually have to attach your own buffer. Um, MPI send, the point is it will do either a, a buffer or synchronous send, depending on whether or not the space in the buffer. Um, but the, the B send, if there's not enough space in your buffer, will fail. And that may happen if, when you scale your program up. And there will be more communications happening. Um, it may also hide other errors in the code, and it's difficult to debug as it is. So it's best to use synchronous sends uh, always to begin with. Um, but yeah, this is the main reason we discourage the use of B sends because of the possibility of it failing with an error. Because uh, what it does is it copies the um, send buffer into its own or into the buffer space that you've attached, and then it waits. It keeps checking whether a receive has been posted. So there is a certain amount of communication going on behind the scenes in MPI. Um, and it won't try and send until the receive is posted. It will just hold your message in the buffer space. Now, obviously, if you don't post or receive, then you'll run into the issue where it's just sitting in the buffer space forever. And your program might still complete OK, depending on how it's written. It may actually be fine if you don't run out of buffer space. But if you run out of buffer space, and you will if you scale that program up, um, it will just fail and kill the entire job. So it's asynchronous, and it's like posting a letter. So you just shove it in the post box, it's gone. Um, but if there's no effort to be received, it's just going to sit in the system forever. And you have to supply your own buffer space with an MPI buffer attach. The real point here as well is that, or as we'll discover later on this afternoon, if you want to do asynchronous communications and you want to, to do useful things like overlap computation and communication, um, the synchronous non-blocking sends uh, provide a much safer and a much better way of doing that um, than B-send. Um, I've given some spoilers for this question. Uh, if you call a standard send and there's no match and receive, which of the following are possible outcomes? OK. so. The message won't disappear. Um, <laughs> so we'll come back to, to B, why B is running out. Um, so the send, it's possible that the send will wait until the receive is posted, potentially waiting forever. That is what will happen if the buffer space is full, for sure. Um, because in that situation, MPI send acts as a synchronous send. It is equivalent to MPI send. It will block, and it will wait. Um, the message is stored and delivered later on uh, in the brackets if possible. So if there is enough buffer space available, um, either on system buffer or thinking buffer space you attach, although I would have to check that. Um, you could only use the system memory. But if, if there is uh, buffer space and there's no receipt posted, um, it will just take a copy, allowing you to reuse the send buffer. Uh, straight away, uh, much like the B send does. Uh, nothing ever times out. Um, and the program continues execution. It doesn't care whether or not the message has actually been received. It just, as soon as that buffer is available again, the program carries on. So 
MPI send won't fail with an error because it won't try and put the message in the buffer if there's not enough space. So the motivation for it originally, and I'll open this up as well so people can, can see the full explanation, but the motivation originally was you had a synchronous send that could deadlock um, NES send and buffered send that might run out of space which was asynchronous. Uh, the point of MPI send was it was meant to be uh, the best of both worlds. So it would check if there was enough buffer space. Uh, and if there was, it would send asynchronously, which is nice for performance. Um, but if it wasn't, then it would just become a synchronous end and, and work anyway. Uh, now, in reality, because you never know exactly what it's going to do and it's machine dependent, it's actually not a safe choice for most types of program. Um, and it's much better to use it, something that you know exactly what it's going to do. Because um, also it means when you scale up your code, uh, you can end up with deadlocks that you weren't expecting with MPI send. So it's another one we, we recommend against. Um, the MPI receive routine has a parameter count. What does this mean? Let's see how we did. Okay, so this one is is a tricky one to get your head around. Um, so in reality, the MPI is just sending byte streams from one place to another. Um, however, when it's asking for the count, because in, in languages like C and Fortran, um, you know, eight bytes, whatever, isn't particularly meaningful because you need to know how to interpret them. Yeah, so you always have a data type. But also the, um, so although A is true, or it should be true in most cases, you would expect that the size of buffer you reserved is the same as the size of the incoming message. It doesn't have to be. Um, what it does have to be is, uh, large enough for the incoming message. If it's not, you'll run into problems. Um, but it therefore means that what, what MPI is interested in is the size of buffer you have reserved in terms of the data type that you said it is or you said should be coming in. So it doesn't, it, MPI never talks about bytes unless you use the MPI byte data type. Um, because although in the background bytes are what's being sent backwards and uh, back and forth, and um, it's not a well formed uh, way of doing things in, in C and Fortran, where you need to specify data types as well. Uh, we need some way to interpret um, the byte streams at each end. Um, so it's always in, in terms of number of items whenever it's talking about count, unless you explicitly tell it just bytes. Um, but also importantly, it's Although it should be the size of the incoming message in most situations, it can be larger. Okay, so you can you can create a much larger buffer um, and put stuff into that. So one reason you might do that is you might want to um, put something into the middle of a, an array, for example. You might like point it to the middle of an array um, and say, okay, the array at this point is this large, and it will just right into the first however many bytes inside the messages. Um, and indeed, you can have uh, complex data, or you can create your own MPI data types as well, um, which may have many different sizes for the buffer. OK, so for receive, count is the size of the local receive buffer, although you expect those to mostly be the same. Uh, so Josh has asked, using MPI send, OK, so Josh is asking uh, if you've Put a load of asynchronous messages into the buffer and then try to send another and it goes synchronous instead because there's not enough room in the buffer and then a receive call is made at the other end uh, assuming that the send or which is received first so assuming that uh, say it's a point to point between the same two so all of your sends are to the same receiver and that's the receiver that posts the receive and it would be the first one that went into the buffer because messages will not overtake if they're between the same two 
MPI ranks. So if they're different MPI ranks, it's uh, it's a different matter to altogether. But um, I would expect those messages to all be in order, provided they're between the same two ranks. Again, I may have given the game away a little earlier. here. What happens if the incoming message is larger than count? So again, so the point of these questions is not to uh, to catch you out uh, or anything like that. It's not not a test. It's just to see because the answer to these questions is not always obvious, and it's not always what you would expect. So it's worth going back over these things. Um, and hopefully, it helps you understand what exactly MPIs do when you call these functions. Why is another much <laughs> deeper question? Often the answer. Uh, is because it seemed like a good idea at the time, and the time was 20 years ago uh, or more uh, in some situations. As I think I mentioned before, the MPI forum is often a place to focus on making it possible for implementers to, to make these functions more optimal and more performant. Um, but that does come at the cost of having or uh, making it less flexible uh, in terms of correctness. Of the code. So, the two major assumptions that MPI makes are that your code is correct um, and that the system is completely infallible and resilient and will never fail. So, it's, it's also not really able to deal with failures in the actual hardware, although there is work ongoing in that area. Let's have a look how we did on this one then. Okay. Uh, so if the incoming message is larger than the count, so if it's larger than the receive buffer, unfortunately, it won't just accept the first count items. Uh, it will actually fail entirely. Um, so you can get away with sending less than the receive buffer. You can get away with uh, having a count less than the send buffer at the send side, because it will just take the first count items um, from that array. But you cannot get away with sending a message that's too large. Um, that that will result in an error. Again, part of the reason for that is is the MPI actually checks. So as I mentioned before, there is a certain amount of, of communication going on in in the background when you're using MPI, um, and it will have a look and see if the the receive buffer is actually large enough. Because if it didn't do that, the the program would just seg fault anyway. And the standard behavior on any error is for the entire MPI program to abort, uh, killing the entire uh, program, which is, is nice in some ways, but very annoying when you've made a small error <laughs> somewhere in your code uh, and you only find out a day later. But there it is. Cool, I've done it again. What happens if the incoming message of size n is smaller than count? Let's just start checking what the next question is before I actually uh, start talking. <laughs> Okay, so if the incoming message is smaller than count, then that's okay. That one works um, because your receiver set aside, your receiver is saying, I have a buffer that can take 100 integers, and the send says, okay, I'm sending 10 integers. The receiver goes, I do have space for at least 10 integers, and um, that's fine. And it just accepts the entire byte stream from uh, the sending process, the sending rank, um, and deposits it. At the start of or starting from the address that you specified in your receive buffer, and then it goes uh, and it checks the size by making sure that there are ends as well. Um, so, this last one uh, that might seem like a useful thing to do, um, unless, as I sort of mentioned earlier, if you're say trying to receive. Um, a column, say, from the middle of your array, or a row from the middle of your array, or for the middle of your array. So if you're just sending a vector from one end and receiving it as, as part of a matrix, um, you really wouldn't want the rest of that storage to get zeroed. Um, and fundamentally, so you know, MPI assumes you know what you're doing, so it won't it won't do things outside of what you tell it. And so in the explanation here, it points out as well that often um, all these sizes are known. But uh, so yes, the one thing you can do, of course, is just create a buffer that is uh, quote unquote large enough um, and always receive into that buffer uh, because you don't know exactly how many items are going to be sent in any particular send 
you just know that it'll be less than some certain size. Um, so MPI is happy to let you do that. Uh, and then you can use the status to find out what the actual count of the received message was, um, which is another important point. But as I said, these are not, the answers are not necessarily obvious, um, but it's worth going over. Uh, so how is the actual size of the incoming? Oh, done it again. How is the actual size of the incoming message reported? Uh, most of the way, let's see how we did. Ah, uh, it's stored in the status parameter. Ooh, someone guess so the, let's have a look at that last one first. So via the associated tag, tag is uh, something that you set as the application developer uh, that is used to match messages. So it's used to match sends and receives. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything about the, the message size. Um, and no, so the, the, the count in the receive is just the size of the buffer that you have already uh, allocated, um, whether it's on the heap or stack uh, is up to you, but it's it's just the, the buffer size for the receive buffer uh, in terms of number of items or number of whatever data type. Um, but the actual count uh, that gets received is stored in this message status parameter, uh, which is a struct in C, um, an array of integers in Fortran before 2008, and a struct, but whatever the Fortran name is, mapped in Fortran 2008. So you do have to pass it through the helper routine MPI get count uh, for this thing I mentioned, for the, for the reason I mentioned earlier, that MPI is in the background, of course, just sending byte streams. From one rank to another. Um, so, how many ints did I receive is not a well formed question unless you also tell it, um, you know, of type int. It needs to be able to work out what, what the data type is again separately. Um, and MPI get count does that. So, MPI get counts arguments are just the status parameter um, from the from the receive and the data type. Ah, and that's us. So, uh, well done, everyone. Hopefully, that was useful. Um, uh, and what we're going to do now is actually go through, uh, not, not, in, uh, not necessarily in full, but have a look at the solutions to the um, uh, the exercise from last week, which is about solving pi. And as ever, we're going to be doing this on Cirrus. So ah, I even have the MPP solutions dot already there. <laughs> this is not. Uh, and like one of the things that we've suggested you to use, we suggested uh, mobile XTOR, for example. Um, I don't, in, so this is just my work laptop, I don't generally often need an X server, um, although from the fact that there is a picture on here, I can see I was testing out here. Um, because I don't often need an X server, I don't actually use XTOR in general. Um, this is actually just Windows PowerShell underneath. Um, as Windows does now include SSH tools by default. Uh, however, I'm using it through something called Conimu, which is console emulator. And all that really does is let's set a different color scheme uh, for PowerShell because the default uh, directory colors that you get, so this MPP solutions, for example, um, the default colors you get off a Linux machine are completely unreadable. The MC of the PowerShell or the command prompt backgrounds, and it's a pain to try and find something that works. So this just helps me do that. But there's nothing magic about this program I'm using for SSH in other than that. Um, so let's go and have an actual look at the Pi solution. Okay. Mm -hmm. So be prepared for things to go horribly wrong. So far, so good. Let's just check the make all works. It does not. Excellent. Let's sort that out first. Uh, ah. <laughs> oh. So um, what I've got on there is module load MPT. <laughs> um, uh, module load Intel compilers. I told you something was going to go wrong. Excellent. Uh, let's just try make again. There we go. Okay, all good. Um, so let's just MPR. Ah, so someone asked me in an email 
the other day as well, uh, what the difference is between MPI run and MPI exec underscore MPT. Um, MPI run is a wrapper. Because we've loaded the MPT module, uh, MPI run is just calling uh, HPM or MPI exec MPT essentially. Um, underneath, however, it is a convenience wrapper because MPI run is easier to type. So on the login nodes, um, there's an alias in a bash essentially that just says uh, MPI run means this, depending on which module you load. Uh, on the back end, you need to use MPI exec MPT because that alias does not exist. But it's less crucial because you will just be writing it into um, your PBS script. Um, so essentially, MPI run and MPI exec MPT in this case are the same thing. Uh, it's just one of them only exists on the login node. Now, that said, uh, different MPI libraries and MPI implementations have different uh, MPI launches. Um, MPI run is the name of the typical one for open MPI, for example. Um, whereas MPI that kind of MPT is the HPE MPT library's primary uh, launcher. Uh, and I think there's MPI exec is, I want to say, MPI CH's standard one. So it may vary. You may have to use a specific one uh, depending on which library you're actually using which implementation of the MPI library you're actually using. Um, on Cirrus, it's MPI run is fine on the, the login nodes. And on the back end, you need to use MPI exec underscore MPT, uh, assuming that you're using um, MPT, MPI. I think there is also a, another MPI library that you can choose on here. Um, but yeah, nothing of any differences. OK. So let us just try running this Pi example. OK, and as you can see, 3.141593, not bad. I'll take that. So that's just on four processes. Um, OK, and what I should do as well is let's have a quick look at the exercise sheet again, just to remind ourselves of what the point of this exercise was. Okay, so we have some numerical approximate way of calculating pi, uh, and the aim is simply to, to split this up um, across MPI processes. Now, okay, let's open up a C file. Um, I'm going to use the C example uh, primarily because um, I prefer C. <laughs> oh, there we go. OK, uh, so there's nothing particularly special up here. So here's the MPI include. It is just the standard uh, include, as you would find uh, in C or C++. Um, and here we defined N to be 840. Now, one thing that's worth noting is this N, of course, is not the same. So this is the N that the summation goes to, but it is not the same N as uh, as the number of processes you run. Um, that does not need to be the case. It is slightly simpler if it uh, if the number of processes um, can evenly divide that number, uh, but it's not not absolutely necessary. You can definitely write it so that it's not needed. Um, and this just looks like standard C code. Uh, so the the communicator has its own data type um, in C and C plus plus, MPI com and MPI status. These are actually just uh, structs underneath. Um, on the older versions of Fortran, uh, it is an integer array. In Fortran 2008, they have the concept of structs, so uh, it becomes a struct as well with its own data type. Um, OK, and you can see what we've got here is an I start and I stop, and these are quite important. We'll see why in a minute. Um, these, this solution I'm looking at, by the way, is just in the uh, mpsolutions.tar. Um, so if you do want to have a look at it, if you haven't already, um, and compare against your own solution. Uh, yeah, and is slightly sneakily hidden here under week one, where it says, here is a tar file containing simple solutions. And that's where I've gotten all this from. So if you, if you wish to blue Peter it, you can. 
Um, okay, and here we set com equals MPI com world. Um, so this is our MPI communicator. Uh, you don't straight really do this, it's just that it's easier in writing MPI com world in everywhere yourself. Um, and it means you can't change it later on, obviously. But uh, you can always also just write MPI com world in if you prefer. Uh, MPI init null null, we can also provide argc and argv, um, although it's quite rare for them to actually do anything. Uh, so these calls, I hope, so this is from the week one exercise, you should be familiar with these, it just says uh, the size of the communicator, uh, and which rank this particular, uh, or which rank am I essentially. Bear in mind that four copies of this code get, um, get launched. So I mean, also to come back to an earlier point from the quiz, uh, note that the MPI unit is down here somewhere, uh, and the start of our code is up here. So all of these things get declared uh, on every process uh, of the, however many are launched. So four in the, back of the previous case. Um, all these things still get declared on every process, even though the MPI unit doesn't happen until down here. MPI unit does nothing but enable the starter communications. Um, so you need to do that before you can call com size and com rank. Um, and here we have our first fork in the code based on that rank. Uh, so if I, let's just show this as well. So if I comment these out, oh, <laughs> to recompile first. So what you can see there, okay, is that all four ranks have, um, in fact, yes, I'll show that in a second. So all four ranks have printed this now because it's no longer forked based on the rank ID, um, or based on rank. Uh, they all just printed exactly the same thing. So there's a few things to, to think about here. Uh, first of which, is that I can do something up here, before MPI init, just to labor this point a bit more. Oh. Apologies for my total inability to type, there we go. Okay, so you can see that hello is printed four times, uh, even though it's 40 in behind it, because they're all running exactly the same code up until that point. So another thing to note so let's see if there's a Good point to do this. Hmm. Okay. So if I had said, so this is computing approximation, how let's do this one. So let's do that. So everyone's going to say running on uh, however many processes. Um, I am process. So if I do this and have each one report as rank, another thing that's worth noting about that is that, in fact, it's come out in a very random order. So you can see that there's no particular order in which they will print. Um, Print statements won't come out in any particular order uh, ever, generally speaking, unless you do something to enforce that. Um, it can be in whatever order each process gets to that point in. Uh, but also, yeah, so here we have two and three. But you can also see that there are completely different points in the code as well. So uh, process two has printed hello, and process, oh, and process two, and then has already gone through its calculation before process three comes out, uh, or before process three has its print. Um, now, that doesn't actually even necessarily mean that, that process two ran ahead 
of process three because of the way that uh, print buffering works in various machines, there's really no guarantee about the order of these things when you're running multiple processes except that within a single process. So within uh, say rank zero, I would expect every statement printed by rank zero to appear in order. However, that order relative to any other process has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Um, and indeed may change if I, yeah, there we go. So if I run exactly the same thing again, completely different order. And here it is, zero, one, two, three. Um, so the orders of print statements are not meaningful and should not be relied upon, which is kind of annoying. Um, and with that, I see that we are just about up to three. Uh, and we do have some time to, to carry on looking through this price solution uh, after the break. So I propose that we, we begin the break um, and meet back here at half three. Uh, we'll go a bit further into, into this pie solution uh, and talk about a couple of things that are worth noting about it. Um, and then we will be discussing asynchronous, sorry, <laughs> both synchronous and asynchronous non-blocking communications um, which I'm sure everyone will be uh, interested in, has already had a lot of questions leaning towards that. Um, hopefully, uh, it will clear a lot of things up um, about how exactly you should use uh, asynchronous communication. So, uh, see you back here at half three. Have a good break. I'm going to go and get some coffee. Thanks for that. Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to Online MPI. Um, so we're going to start this session off by uh, just going back to looking through the solution to the Pi problem from last week and putting out a few interesting features of the uh, sample solution. As I said, the reason that I'm using this uh, Connie me to, to SSH into Cirrus is that it lets me actually configure the color scheme because using command prompt and PowerShell, you can't. And then um, things like comments, which are always key to, to blue in Vim, are completely unreadable. Um, but even with this, it can be tricky. Um, as you notice, it's a little bit brighter on my screen when it actually comes through on the on Collaborate as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for pointing out to me. It was a little bit difficult to read. Uh, you can also, of course, find these solutions um, on the website too. If you want to read through on your own your own computer. Um, okay, so I will carry on. Where had I got to? <laughs> ah yes, okay, so we were looking at the fact that if I could square them again quickly. Um yeah, print you can see my attempts to work out why. <laughs> uh, let's do this. Why then insists on starting in replace mode. Um, so the order will always be different for print statements. There's no real guarantee there, except that uh, within a single process, it will come out in order. But you shouldn't put any stock in a timing. Um, there's no real way to coordinate that, that that wouldn't involve a lot of overhead. So if you do require a specific output from specific ranks, you need to include synchronization through the MPI uh, routines. Um, or you need to fork as well. So if you just want one rank uh, to print, then you use an if like this. So another thing to note as well is that we, we've used consistently rank zero um, for this kind of forking where we just want one statement out. There is absolutely nothing special about rank zero. Um, and there's no ordering to the way in which that MPI assigns ranks, generally speaking. Um, the only thing that is special about rank zero is that it is the only rank that is guaranteed to exist uh, for all numbers of MPI processes. Because if you only run one MPI process, um, it's rank zero because they're all zero indexed. Um, so rank zero is always there, um, whereas any other rank uh, might not be, depending on the number of processes you actually launch. So it's often used for being the one to print stuff out for that reason. Um, 
so on to the actual calculation of n. So if I go quickly back to the exercise sheet, uh, it's just implementing this summation here. But one thing that's key is that we don't um, need to go through all this entire summation on every single uh, process. And because uh, additions are associative, we can we can calculate individual sections of that um, sum on different processes and then just add them all together. Uh, however, in order to, to do that, we don't um, we don't say, okay, if I'm rank one or if I'm rank zero, do this part of the loop. If I'm at rank one, do this part of the loop. Uh, a much sort of smarter way to do it is to actually define the starting integer and the stopping integer for your loop. So then define the loop conditions based on rank, which is what we've done here. Um, so you can see why this is dependent on the number of processes that's launched and the value of n, because of this n divided by size. Um, so part of the, the exercise towards the end was to, uh, if you got that far through it, um, was to look at how you could set this up so that wasn't necessary. Uh, one simple solution is actually just to round this number down and then whatever is left at the end, or you simply add to the stop condition for uh, for rank zero, for example, um, is a general general way of, of solving that issue. Is you just have one of your processes do a little bit more work, um, and usually that's that's fine. It, in certain situations, it could lead to a large load imbalance, but generally speaking, um, if it's just to finish up the, the problem, then it's quite all right to simply have rank zero do a little bit more than everybody else. Um, so that's what I'm saying. And you can see here then we have the same for loop for every rank because they've all set based on their rank, the I start and I stop uh, conditions. Uh, and this is just a summation inside that. Uh, for C programmers like me, um, something to watch out for is the fact that as it's a summation, it is actually important what the initial number is, and it's one, not zero. Um, and also, it's 2n inclusive. <laughs> These are two things which are worth, which often catch me out. Um, you, may, you may simply be smarter than me and avoid that trap, but there's been many a time when I've been trying to work out why a calculation is wrong, and it's because I'm doing a summation from um, 0 to n minus 1, um, and it should be 0 to n. And also note that you need to, to cast these to doubles in C. Uh, okay, but that's not too much of an issue. Um, okay. And then we simply print out what, what everyone's partial value is. And then here, uh, we just use point to point communication. Okay, to get all the answers back to rank zero. So it does say uh, that, you know, this would be more efficiently done using NPI reduce. Um, that's true. And we'll be looking at the collective communications such as NPI reduce in the last week, which is actually not next week, as unfortunately I'm away at Big Bang Fair in Birmingham. And um, so the week after that, we will be looking at collective communications. Uh, but for now, we're just going to use point to point. Okay. Uh, and we say if if I'm rank zero. Okay. First of all essentially add in to my value of pi, uh, the partial pi that I have calculated, and then get ready to receive from every other source. Um, and all this does is just set up a receive from everywhere. And if I'm not rank zero, so this else statement completes that if statement and follows on from that if statement, um, send synchronously my value. So one thing that's worth noting here uh, I think it's actually the other way around. Is we could replace this with MPI any source, okay, and this will still work just fine. Um, because the tags match. Uh, so it will happily just match those in any order. Okay, uh, it's still 
still giving perfectly reasonable results. Um, and there it will just match the first one that came in each time and it's quite happy with that. However, if, if you do need to constrain the uh, specific source and you could, so if you need things to arrive in a certain order, then we can change this back to um, back to source like so. And just a reminder that for the receive, we need to give it an address, um, even though it's just a, an integer declared on the, on the stack. Um, and the address of the status goes in there. And if we wanted to check the actual source, uh, if we're using npm source, we could find that out from the status as well. Um, OK, here we just could replace that with a plus equals, but there we go. Uh, yep, and it's all done using sy synchronous sends, so all quite safe. Uh, now, yes, and it's all sending to rank zero. So I hope that all, all makes a reasonable amount of sense. Um, do feel free to ask questions either in the chat or by email later on if you do have any. Uh, here we're just calculating pi separately to, to print out an error. Um, and I will just quickly show you the other language solutions. I think there should be a... Hmm. So I mean, the C++ one, um, actually, let me just check that I have the most recent version of MPP solutions. Uh, oh, <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, I thought there might be. No, oh, apparently not. Okay, so I don't have a C++ version available, but uh, essentially it's the same. Unfortunately, uh, if you are a C++ programmer, uh, when it comes to writing MPI, you are essentially uh, back to doing um, C with standard out instead of printf. <laughs> there was at some point a uh, proposed C++ interface, but it is no longer supported. Uh, but okay, what I will do quickly then is just show off the, um, for the, the Fortran programmers amongst us. I will show off the, the Fortran solution. Okay, so it's it's more or less the same. Um, yeah, and equals a forty. Still setting a separate i stop and i stop. The main differences are really this um, here actually. So uh, first of all, there's i error. Um, <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> so i error here uh, is in, is important because it's needed for all uh, MPI routines in Fortran. Um, and then second of all, for Fortran before F2008, um, this is a array of MPI status size, an integer array. Uh, in Fortran 2008, if you're using that interface, it is a struct. Uh, and then it all looks a lot more similar to the, to the C, because you can also skip out the IR. Um, OK. And just a little this. All very much the same. And again, you can you can look through this, and there we go. Uh, so you can look through this. Uh, it's just in the FMPI full directory under that tar instead. Um, but there's really nothing different other than the data types used for um, internal. Uh, 
MPI thing, so COM is just an integer as well, rather than being a defined data type as it is in C. Um, okay. So uh, now that you've all been waiting for, we are going to look at non-blocking communications. There we go. Okay. Non-blocking communications. Um, so uh, I know that we, we've already, so there'll probably be some repetition involved, but I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. So for, from previous weeks, that is, if I have a sort of round the ring communication pattern um, that I'm trying to implement, one of the dangers is that if I just do that with sends and receives, uh, or synchronous sends and receives, that will deadlock. Okay, the reason it will deadlock is that everybody is trying to receive at the same time or is trying to send at the same time they need to be receiving. Um, and there are a few solutions to this. Uh, one of which is to pattern, sort of follow some pattern in the ordering of your um, sends and receives, um, often called a red black uh, communication pattern example, where you will simply say every odd number sends and then receives, and every even number receives and then sends. But now those types of solutions are not necessarily scalable. Um, so we're going to look at a much uh, more general solution this week. Uh, but first, we're going to revisit, because it is, it is confusing. Uh, it can be the two different ways in which an MPI communication routine um, is defined. So there's the mode and the form. The mode determines when it completes, uh, and that means when it completes at both ends of the communication. Okay, so it's either synchronous or asynchronous. If it's synchronous, then both parties or all parties to the communication um, will complete at the same time. Okay, so a synchronous send needs to match with the receive and they will both um, complete. Okay. Um, and as, as because the whole communication has completed, uh, naturally for any synchronous communication, um, the buffer is reusable thereafter. Um, for an asynchronous communication, okay, one end uh, both ends of the communication or all parties of the communication will complete separately or may complete separately. So this is more like a buffered send where the buffered send um, will simply copy the data out of the send buffer and stash it away somewhere else. Um, and then it will have finished. So the buffered send will complete and return. Um, and the buffer will be reusable as soon as it does so. But it hasn't actually completed the communication. It hasn't sent anything and may not until a receive is ready at the other end. It will not until a receive is ready at the other end. So on the other hand, OK, the form, that's blocking versus non-blocking. And that determines when the procedure will return. So a blocking communication, which is all the ones we've looked at so far, um, Buffered send and synchronous send. So buffered send is also blocking because you can be sure that the buffer is reusable as soon as it's completed. Um, but a non-blocking send, which is what we're looking at today, will return control to the user program, but will not promise that the buffer is reusable. Uh, so you will be allowed to continue with whatever you're doing, but you don't know for sure that the send buffer or receive buffer can be used again for something else until you check. And we're going to look at exactly what that means. Ah, OK, so here again, blocking operations. Um, this relates to when the operation is completed. OK, and that's your S send and your receive, and also your B send. Um, And apologies because I've <laughs> because I've not got the uh, the PowerPoint and there would have been animations here. But 
I'm sure I can still make the point. Um, so a non-blocking operation will return straight away, uh, and you can continue to perform other work. Um, and then you can either test or wait for completion of the non-blocking operation. So a little diagram to illustrate this uh, is again using a fax machine, something that I'm sure we've all got a lot of experience with. Um, <laughs> so here you can put your put your message in, okay. And then you go away and go back to um, to churning butter or whatever it is that this stick figure represents uh, while the message sends. Okay, so you can you can overlap your communication and your computation while the message is actually sending, and then you return a little while later. Um, check that that send is actually completed. Okay, and it's been received at the other end, uh, so that you can reuse. Um, the message uh, or the send to buffer uh, really is the point there. So it lets you do stuff while send while communication is happening. Um, so importantly, all non-blocking operations should have matching wait operations. Um, okay, some systems can't read free resources until wait has been called. Um, a non-blocking operation immediately followed by the wait. So that, if I go back to this slide, where it says that sometime later the program can test the wait, we'll look precisely at the difference between those two in a bit. But for now, we're just going to think about, about wait. And what a wait does is uh, waits for that operation to complete. So um, it says, I've started an asynchronous communication. And now I need to wait for that to actually finish. I need that reserve to be uh, received to be confirmed before I can do anything more. So if you have a non-blocking operation immediately followed by a matching wait, that is equivalent to the same blocking operation. OK, the non-blocking operations aren't the same as sequential subroutine calls as the operation continues after the call has returned. Uh, what I really mean there is if you're writing sort of standard serial code um, where I have a single single process and a single thread, when my code is running, when it enters the function, I expect it to not continue through my program until whatever is inside that function has been done. Okay, it won't return from that function and carry on with the code until everything inside that function is complete. Uh, Non-blocking operations don't work like this. So they return, but whatever it started is carrying on in the background. OK? Uh, in this case, it will always be a communication that's been started. And that's happening at the same time as you're away doing other things. Um, so I hope it's, it's clear why that's useful. Um, but you then need to explicitly complete, essentially, that function. And the way you do that is by waiting. Uh, so you can sort of separate communication to three, or rather, non-blocking communication separate communication to three phases. Uh, they initiate, so you begin sending or receiving, um, and then you can do some work. It may involve other communications, may not. Um, you can do whatever, and you wait for non-blocking communication to complete. And you must always wait. Um, so the non-blocking sends, so here we have an example of it sending from 2 to 0. Um, ah, yes. So there are, there are both non-blocking sends and non-blocking receives. Um, and to a large extent, these follow all the same rules as the blocking versions um, in terms of matching and then not overlapping one another and so on. Um, but the important point is that While you can do both, uh, a non-blocking send and receive, uh, it may be simpler to simply do one <laughs> at a time, at least to begin with. Um, but essentially, they're, they're, you know, they're doing what you expect them to be doing. So the send will begin the sending process. Uh, it needs a match and receive of some sort, and it will, and you have to wait for it to finish to be sure that the receive has happened. Um, Equally, you can initiate a non-blocking receive, 
Okay, and it will stay in there until, or it will continue. Okay, sorry, it will return immediately. Um, but at some point you have to wait to make sure that receive actually has happened. And you still need there to be a matching send somewhere in the system, or you will run into problems. And by problems, I mean deadlock. Uh, so the handles used are broadly the same. So you still need MPI data, take, data type. Uh, you still need a communicator. Uh, communications are only within a communicator. Um, the additional one is an MPI request. So it's an MPI request data type in uh, C, C++, or simply an integer in Fortran. Um, and that request handle is allocated when the communication is initiated. So when you begin the non-blocking communication, um, you get a handle back. And that is what you need to wait on. So later on, uh, you will say, I want to wait for this communication to finish, or I want to test that it has this communication finished or not. Um, so here's the actual syntax uh, for C in Fortran. And these are, you'll notice that it's MPI IS send, that is MPI immediate synchronous send. So the, the kind of code for the non blocking communications in MPI is immediate. Um, so an I something is a, a non blocking version of that function. Um, and again, it may seem counterintuitive that it is non-blocking but synchronous. Uh, it's synchronous because the buffer is not free until, so free for use, the send buffer is not free for use until after the request has completed. Um, however, it is non-blocking because you can do other stuff while it's going on. Um, okay, and there's the MPI wait. Uh, so you'll see at the very end of the MPI IS send, uh, there's this MPI request and then pointer to or the address of a request. Um, you need to supply that same request to MPI wait at some point in the future, uh, as well as an MPI status. Um, and the request will tell it which one or which you know, communication you're wanting to, to wait for. Uh, the status is exactly the same as the status everywhere else in MPI code. It's just about returning some useful information once it has completed, um, which you may choose to entirely ignore. So it's perfectly valid to simply declare a single MPI status somewhere at the top of your code, and then just always supply that address throughout if you know that you're never going to need to actually look at it. Um, that's quite OK. Um, you Uh, Chris here is asking uh, if the pointer request is something you've allocated memory for, or does it come from the MPI buffer? Uh, it is something that you have allocated memory for. Uh, it's most likely that that will simply be stack memory, so you don't have to do a malloc, uh, although you could do. Um, but you really generally only need, well, in a lot of cases, you will only maybe need one or like a, a couple of. Uh, of requests. If you do need it for whatever reason, if you need a lot of MPI requests, you could map up an array of them. Um, there are there are certainly examples where I've seen okay, never actually a malloc, um, but I have seen arrays of requests created for various reasons. Um, that's quite common, but generally, yeah, it's just something on the stack. So it's exactly the same as, um, for example, if you're sending a single integer. You would just declare int whatever variable name and somewhere in your code. So it gets allocated on stack, but it is there. And then you can supply the address of that variable uh, to the send buffer. Um, you can do the same thing by saying MPI request request, and then just give and request to the function. Uh, in Fortran, everything is uh, passed by reference anyway. So you don't need to worry about explicitly saying it's an address. Um, and everything is, is an integer, at least in the old style uh, interface. So you don't need to worry about any this. You do need to remember to send error. But the kind of the format, the signature of these calls is, is I hope, relatively um, uh, it's clear to see the, the small differences between that and the, the blocking communication. Um, Okay, any clue for the receive, it's an I receive, an immediate receive, um, and it looks 
pretty much the same as a receive, uh, only with the request argument at the very end. Um, so that later on, you can match it with a weight. And as with the sends, you must always, always, always match it with a weight. Um, if you don't, the code will either deadlock or eventually uh, possibly fail with an error. Um, because MPI, you know, it depends, it may finalize over it, but the resources that is set aside for doing those requests won't be free until uh, until the MPI wait has been called. Um, so you should always make sure you call MPI wait. Also because then, in, you know, especially in the case of the receive, it's not safe. Uh, so that I should, I should explicitly say as well, it is, so in the send case and in the receive case, it is not safe to access the buffer that you have supplied for the send or receive until after MPI wait is called. Um, you should not modify it, you should not read from it until MPI wait has happened because the communication is essentially ongoing until MPI wait um, comes back. So MPI wait is a blocking function, uh, although the immediate send or receive before it is not, uh, the wait is. Um, and once that wait completes, you can be certain that the buffer is safe for reuse or reading, but not until after that. You can, so the stuff that you can do in between those two points, however, uh, you know, as long as it doesn't relate to the buffer that you're using for sending or receiving is completely okay. Um, you can do whatever you like. But you just have to leave that part of the memory alone until afterwards. Um, okay, and you can use a blocking send with a non-blocking receive and vice versa. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, I would actually recommend that. Um, unless, so you may find you have a good reason for wanting to do uh, non-blocking at both ends. Um, but in many instances, I would suggest that you know it's fine just to have one side be non-blocking uh, and make the other block. Um, and then okay, if you find that if you find that there is a good reason to to do otherwise later on, then try that. I mean, for a first I would actually for a first pass at a code, I would always actually recommend just beginning with sync, simple synchronous sims um, and then maybe make it uh, non-blocking later if you think that you know there's something you can overlap there. Um, okay, but you don't have to match blocking and non-blocking communications. Uh, you, know, you can do a blocking send to a non-blocking receive or a non-blocking send to a blocking receive. Um, and the non-blocking sends can use any mode, synchronous, buffered, or standard. Um, because synchronous affects completion, not initiation. So again, that's this point that um, the fact that it's synchronous or not determines when, uh, yes, when when the communication has completed. Okay, so it means those two processes, or however many processes are involved in the communication, if it's collective, uh, all those processes are synchronized at that point um, because they're both completing that communication at the same time. Um, whereas in the asynchronous case, it copies that data into a buffer first. Um, so another point really is that, yes, you can do uh, non-blocking asynchronous communication. You can do an ID send. Um, but really, all you're doing there is waiting or is uh, allowing overlap of the time it takes you to copy your send buffer into the buffer space. Um, That might be worthwhile, but it's uh, it would be a niche use case, I imagine, um, where there's actually much point to that. Um, so ISMs are much more commonly used, um, and it's much clearer why it's useful because communication can take some time. Um, but yeah, both synchronous and asynchronous uh, non-blocking communications exist, um, and indeed that you can do use, use as, a, as an ISend. Um, which is the same thing as MPI send, but non-blocking, which may do either uh, asynchronous or synchronous communication. Um, what the blocking versus non-blocking tells you is that 
or it separates out the initiation from the completion of that communication or that function um, with the caveat that the buffer is not safe to reuse in the time in between. Okay, so here's a quick rundown of them all. Uh, the NPI I send, the IS send, the IV send. Again, the IV send is a little bit harder to see what the point would be um, because all you're really waiting for there in the time in between is, is it the, the buffer to be copied. It might be very large. It might, might take a while. Um, but then if it is very large, why do you want to take a copy of it and keep it on the same machine? Um, you'd be as well just doing an IS send. <laughs> Uh, rather than doubling up the space required to hold it on that particular node. Um, okay, and then there's the, the I receive. Um, so waiting versus testing, I sort of mentioned testing earlier, but didn't really tell you much about it. Uh, not because it's mysterious, but because it's a, a slightly more niche use, use case, to be honest. And um, so it is a bit like, uh, probing really um, so mpi wait will block until the communication has completed okay so as mentioned uh, an immediate communication followed by a wait is equivalent to the blocking version of that communication and um, mpi test will not block it will simply return a flag uh, or rather overwrite a flag that you provide it and um, that says that is true if that communication uh, has completed and false otherwise. Um, okay, and the syntax is, is similar in the sense that you have uh, an MPI request and MPI status um, with the addition of this flag that you need to check. So one thing that's important to note is MPI testing and MPI waiting are not the same uh, in the sense that you cannot just when your MPI test returns true, that doesn't mean you're done. You still need to call MPI wait, but you just know that MPI wait will return pretty much immediately um, because the communication will be completed. Um, but MPI test is a way of knowing whether or not that's ready to happen without it actually blocking. So if you have a communication that you suspect will take a very long time, um, you might want to put in MPI tests um, to check and see. Okay, and if it returns false, you might say, okay, well, then actually I'll do this other bit first. Um, that is about the only use case I can think of for it. Uh, and again, generally, it's better just to put the MPI wait immediately before you actually need that buffer again um, and say, okay, this is the point in my code at which this needs to have happened, so I will just wait for it to happen here. Uh, and if, if the communication has already completed, um, it will just return pretty much immediately. It will be very quick. Um, but MPI test is a way of, of uh, doing more advanced communication patterns. So you can actually check and see whether your um, non-blocking communication has completed before explicitly waiting for it to complete. Um, and the Fortran syntax is, as ever, basically the same as the C1, except there's no pointers, and there's an I error uh, argument as well, because there is no return as a subroutine. Okay, so a little example here um, with some 10 inch of buffer send array uh, getting IS send id um, or IS sent. Uh, and now, in between, you could in principle be doing something uh, here, we're not really. Well, okay, we're calling this do something else function, uh, <laughs> which is missing an underscore, I note. Um, okay, and then followed up by an MPI wait. Uh, equally, at the other end, we start to receive operation um, and sort of do something else while that's ongoing, followed by an MPI wait. Uh, so examples where this can be useful, um, sort of in more real-world applications, is if you have some code that does a domain de decomposition. So, you know, it's input is some grid that it divides up amongst the processes, um, and you have to do halo swaps. Uh, yeah, if you have to do halo swaps, then you can basically work on the parts of your, your grid that are not 
in the halo or near the edges. So aren't affected by boundary conditions. You can do whatever you need to um, on the interior part while that communication is completing um, and then come back to the communication later to actually include your new boundary conditions. Um, that's, a, that's a common use case. Um, but yeah, I, I hope it's reasonably clear why these social things are useful. Um, I guess in the questions of getting last week actually that you guys are uh, well up for doing non-blocking communications already. Um, but most of the most of the like cool signature is the same as for the blocking ones. It really is just this extra request. Um, okay, and again here and it's what we discussed earlier, request is declared somewhere above. That's fine. Um, so you do have to, one thing you should be a little bit wary of is to make sure that in your code you're not overwriting requests um, by accident. So if you do have multiple ISMs, um, they do need to be looking at different requests. Um, okay, which is one reason that sometimes you see arrays of requests. If you always know that, you're, for example, again, doing a halo swap, you might need four uh, requests all at the same time. Uh, on each iteration, so then you can create an array. However, as long as you don't uh, overwrite in between um, uh, sort of non-blocking communications um, or while non-blocking communications are ongoing, you're okay. So you can um, overwrite them again in the next iteration. That would be fine. But while the non-blocking communication is ongoing, you should you should leave that request alone because you will need it uh, to supply to the weight. Um, and you can, you know, you'll run into problems if you find that you're um, stopping yourself from being able to access requests for communications that have been started um, in a non-blocking way. So do be a little bit wary of that. Um, you can uh, do this in multiple yes, so it's more or less what the same. So now you can just await for completion of one message. Uh, there is a test all and wait all um, that you simply supply an array of requests to. Um, and there is a uh, test or wait for simply as many as possible. Um, I think that's if some of those requests aren't active, you can still supply the array. I'll have to check that. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of testing multiple non blocking communications, you can think of this as your, your process having multiple in trays. And it can look at each of them um, to see uh, if anything's arrived. Um, ah, okay, and so someone did ask me about this the other day as well. Uh, there is also, so this is another sort of slightly advanced um, uh, communication. Uh, it's a send receive. So it, it essentially swaps. Uh, that's the buffer on two different um, two different ranks. Uh, so you supply it with a send buffer and a receive buffer. I mean, essentially, the, the call signature is that of a send uh, plus that of a receive um, with only one MPI status between them. And the idea is that both these operations will happen at probably the same time. Uh, you do need to make sure that your send buffer and your receive buffer uh, are different. <laughs> Don't think that you can uh, just put the same buffer in for both. That would cause problems. Um, but there's another way of avoiding deadlock and something like this method around the ring example uh, from the very beginning of this talk. Uh, however, so send receive is fine for that as well, um, but it's not as generally as applicable because it is pairwise. Um, whereas sort of non-blocking sends and receives can happen. Uh, through the same range of options that any other uh, sends and receives can. So they're a lot more generally useful. But if you do have a simple pairwise communication pattern, there's nothing to stop you send and receive. Um, okay. So that uh, brings us to the end of this lecture, really. Uh, just before I move on to just showing off a bit about the next exercise, um, I'm introducing it. Are there any questions? Uh, so Marta's asking uh, if the request is what help, I, helps identify the weight. Um, so it identifies the, if I go back to here, 
So the, the request identifies a particular asynchronous communication. Uh, <laughs> I've done it. A particular non-blocking communication, sorry, uh, is, is unique. So uh, the request is unique to a particular non-blocking communication, uh, and you need to like keep it. You must keep a hold of it until it's applied to the MPI weight. Yeah, so it it, it tells weight what um, non-blocking communication it should be waiting for, um, or indeed test what uh, non-blocking communication it should be testing. Um, and it is unique to that communication, uh, and you must not lose it. However, once you've called MPI weight, uh, the request is safe for reuse as well as the, the send or receive buffer. So MPI weight completes the communication. And all resources are, are you know, free for reuse again then. Um, all the sort of matching rules as well are the same for uh, blocking communications, um, including things like uh, messages not overtaking one another. Um, but you can use this type of communication to break that block. Well, uh, so Mark is asking if that means the I send or I receive assigns the request. Uh, yeah, so it, it writes into the um, the request uh, struct or the MPI request data type uh, in C or in Fortran into the request um, integer. And yes, yeah, uh, it so. It's not like the tag in the sense that so the tag is used for matching communications across the network. So MPI uses a tag to actually match up sends and receives. The, uh, the request just matches um, on the side that has initiated the non-blocking communication. It just matches weight with that non-blocking communication. And there is the stuff in the background the MPI does. The MPI will send some messages in order to determine when the communication is completed at both ends. So that's how it knows uh, overall. But the, the request is a thing that exists locally to a process. Um, OK, great. Well, thank you for the, the good questions, as always. OK, so we'll have a little look at the exercise for, for next week. Again, don't worry if you are not on for this exercise yet uh, or you're way ahead. It's completely fine. Uh, you're welcome to uh, try these exercises or not in your own time as you see fit. And um, the full exercise sheet is available on the, the course website. Uh, I'll just show you that on here. Um, here we go, under week one, just there. OK. Um, and as, uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, in the first week, this is actually the exercise sheet for our entire message passing program in FSC course. So I don't feel as well that you need to get to the end of it. Um, so there is a little bit about timing routine. So one thing that's quite useful, uh, perhaps I should have mentioned this earlier as well, um, MPI provides MPI W time as a routine which just returns a double precision. I know some of you already looked at this uh, last week, but returns a double precision number, uh, which represents elapsed time in seconds um, for all clock. It's quite useful uh, because it is portable. So wherever there is an MPI library, you can use MPI W time. Um, some of you may or may not have had the joy of dealing with uh, trying to do precision timing MC before, but it is quite a pain, so MPIW time is, is useful. Um, so that's a small note about that. But the main exercise that we're interested in next is this rotating information around the ring. And this is the thing that I mentioned at the start of the lecture, uh, would deadlock with blocking communications used naively. Um, so a possible solution, in fact, I think, I believe I have some slides for this, so perhaps we should go back to here. Um, yeah. So 
so possible solutions uh, you can do the the pairwise matching and uh, red black communication uh, where you simply say odd ranks send then even ranks receive and then vice versa in the next bit um, however it's more interesting to use non-blocking communications and you could do it either way around uh, and indeed you can do both non-blocking um, as I mentioned a couple of times, actually having both sides be non-blocking is, is less common um, because it's often not useful. <laughs> I mean, essentially because, you know, at a certain point, you can look, well, you can look at your code and say, at a certain point, I need to reuse either the send or receive buffer. And um, you can simply put on the, the non-blocking side, you can put the weight in there immediately before you need to reuse the buffer and not worry about it in between. That gives you the maximum possible overlap. Um, and at the same time, at the other end, you know, at a certain point, you're going to need um, that information to just there, and then you might as well just have a blocking uh, receiving, for example. Now, that said, if you suspect or know that, that receive is actually taking a very long time to complete because of the large size of the message you're sending, then it may be worth doing both um, in a non blocking way. But those sorts of use cases are quite unusual, um, although not completely unknown. Um, a couple of notes to, to give you some hints for, for this next exercise. Your neighbors do not change. Um, you, know, you always send to the left and to the right. Uh, and you don't alter the data you receive. So the point here is we're actually just adding up. Perhaps I should go back to the exercise sheet. Point here is we're just calculating the sum of however many numbers or as many numbers as we have um, processes, um, and we want the sum on every single uh, rank. Um, okay, so you're not actually modifying these buffers every time commit they come in. You can just keep a local tally and local count like local sum even um, and simply add in the buffer that you receive each time and that will work perfectly well okay and you pass the data unchanged along uh, and this is uh, again i mentioned this a couple of times already but you must not access the buffer in between so while your non-blocking communication started do not touch the buffer. <laughs> Just leave it alone until you have administered a weight and can be sure that it's safe. Um, and that is true for both sends and receives. Okay. Um, as usual, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to email me. And as an extra thing, before I go, uh, one thing, and this was in the email we sent earlier. Uh, but it might be worth looking at. So at AEVCC, we run a blog. My colleague Mario is forever trying to get people um, <laughs> to write things for it. This article was recently posted uh, by my colleague Dan Holmes. Um, Dan is actually on the MPI forum. Uh, in fact, no, he's there this week. Um, and I, when I leave today, we'll need to go and finish some slides I need to send him for a project we're working on. Exciting background for you there. Um, but he's written this very nice article uh, on what is MPI non blocking for, uh, which, if you're interested, I would encourage you to go and have a look through as well. Uh, it probably explains some of it better than I can, even. Um, so he's on the MPI forum and he's extremely knowledgeable about these sorts of things. Uh, but it's very on topic for this week's lecture, so do go and check that out. Um, if you're interested, feel free also to have a look through the rest of our blog. Um, and that's that's really it for me for this week. Uh, uh, but otherwise, thank you very much, uh, and have a good rest of your day and rest of your week.